Uh, welcome back once again. Now, uh, for the second talk, we have Siddharth Mukaji from ICTS TIFR, and he is going to talk about turbulent sets in uh, living matter. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, I thank you all for being here, and I also want to thank the organizers for this opportunity to talk about some uh, work we did here on living fluid uh, turbulence. So, uh, I just want to start by uh, telling you what we really mean by uh, living fluids or living matter for, uh, basically this term, of course it refers to active matter systems, so which are far from equilibrium where you have some kind of an active agent which is converting some form of energy into propulsion uh, or directed motion. Uh, so you can have, let's say, fish or birds or uh, at the smaller scales, you can have bacteria or microtubule mixtures and so on. So there's really uh, a lot of different length scales here. So this phenomena happens across uh, the living world, also the non-living world, you can also have active matter which is non-living. So the term living is used sort of loosely. It does not really mean that it has to be alive. In our case, it will be, uh, at least in the experiments. Um, now, the other thing is, uh, when you're at a, typically the larger scale organisms which have this flocking kind of behavior, they have a weak compressibility kind of effect, so you can describe an equation of state and so on. People have tried that, so they are probably closer to living gases in some sense but we'll focus on a very dense system and these are typically at the micro scale. So these are cellular uh, systems like bacteria uh, which are swarming and these are what we call living fluids. So they'll also of course be a little bit of uh, an actual fluid, but uh, the density of the bacteria is so high that you can also treat these as dry systems. Uh, of course, individually bacteria look like that. So uh, let's say you have E. coli or Bacillus subtilis, then you have this rod-like uh, entity which has a lot of flagella which helps it uh, to propel. And these are the typical dimensions of these, uh, uh, these creatures. And the, the problem is, of course, that we'll be looking at a system which looks like this. So you have a very highly dense state. So it's very hard to distinguish individual bacteria. And what's really interesting about these dense states is that if you look at the swimming velocity, for instance, of uh, bacteria, then uh, there's a very sharp transition beyond a certain density into a collective state. And uh, this, uh, uh, the speed up is really a factor of five or 10. So this collective state is quite interesting because it enables these uh, creatures to move at velocities uh, which are not accessible to them individually. So there seems to be some biological advantages to doing that. Uh, not everything is known about the system. So uh, let's look at the dense state. So here are some movies we made recently uh, at NCBS where we are doing experiments on E. coli. So uh, what you're seeing is a very, very dense uh, bacterial suspension of E. coli. The only difference between the left and the right is of magnification. So uh, this is just a zoom in of a section there. Uh, and also the movies are real time. So the flow is actually very vigorous as you see. Uh, highly chaotic patterns, you see vortices and uh, actually we also probably didn't have great control on the experiment then. So there's a lot of three dimensionality here, but you can also confine it to more 2D channels and uh, the flow is still robust. You get very similar features. So this is the kind of system uh, uh, we want to probe. Now, this active sort of this turbulence-like state, this is not pathological to bacteria or their organization. You really see it across active matter systems as well. So you can also have non-living systems, as I mentioned, and uh, they can also give you sort of vertical turbulence-like states. Uh, you can have it in epithelial cells, uh, microtubule kinesin mixture. Uh, these are just a few examples. So there are a lot many more systems where uh, this sort of a behavior has been found. So you can imagine it has great interest in, uh, I mean, people really want to know what are the properties of these flows? Can you control these kind of flows? And of course, if it looks like turbulence, is it really turbulence? What do we mean by these words? So this is what my talk will uh, mostly focus on. So uh, how do you model such a system? So you can take a microscopic route where you really model particles. So a very, very simple one would be, uh, let's say a VIC-SEC model where you have individual particles that, uh, that move around with a certain velocity and they respond to their neighbors. So they can reorient themselves. And of course you can add small amount of noise to the dynamics. And this gives rise to these rich uh, flocking kind of states. Uh, so I'll take some risk and I'll try to show you how uh, this looks uh, uh, in a live code, which was at least alive before this talk. So uh, let's see what it does now. All right. So you see that there's, there's one big circle which is moving around. Uh, this one. So I can control how far my particles are looking for neighbors. So if I make that circle very small, you see we have a disordered state. Uh, things are more or less isotropic. 
But if I start making that circle bigger, this orientation, uh, uh, I mean, this realignment uh, property comes in and things begin to flock. And uh, on the top right, uh, I spent a lot of time making a radial PDF of these velocities. So the colors just represent the direction where these particles are moving. And you see, uh, you can transition to a flocking state. Uh, so that there's sort of a flocking parameter where everything starts moving, moving together. Uh, so this is quite interesting. I want to show you something uh, uh, very nice about this system. So let's go to the disordered state. Now I can, of course, freeze this system as well. So I've turned off the velocity. But I can still control the orientation uh, uh, realignment. So you can see how order comes just through that very simple reorientation of particles. So I increase the circle a little bit, and you see things are beginning to tilt. Uh, I can do that further. And uh, if you really make this bigger, uh, you'll see things really align in a velocity like uh, you know, a flow field, basically. So these are, of course, I mean, this is a toy sort of a system. You can, of course, do much better. Uh, but before that, yeah, I want to mention, uh, for instance, Samriddhi and some of his co-workers, they also tried putting these particles in an actual turbulent flow. So when the background flow itself is turbulent and you have particles that are aligning with these Vixec interactions, you can also study the uh, collective motion and so on there. Uh, there are more, of course, uh, detailed models uh, where you can have self-propelled rods. So the ones I showed you were basically just disks, but you can really consider them to be these elongated polar or pneumatic rods. Uh, you can add more uh, detailed uh, interactions, fluctuations, dissipation, and so on. And this really has been very successful in simulating a lot of kinds of uh, these flocking states, active matter systems. But this approach might not be very suitable for us because we want to probe very large length scales. Uh, we want to see uh, emergent flows. Yeah. So this active turbulence is possible only for elongated objects or spherical objects as well? Typically elongated. Okay. That's what's been seen there, mostly. So that's why I, I don't think Clemidomonas, which is also motile, I don't think people have seen turbulent states there. But uh, yeah. All right, so we want to do this in a continuum sense. So how do you do that? So there are, of course, different models. I'll, I'll be using uh, this so-called TTSH model, uh, which is the Toner 2 Swift Honberg. So it's essentially a phenomenologically derived model. So they tried to take the Navier-Stokes equations, added terms from pattern forming systems. So those are these red Swift Honberg terms. And they added terms from uh, Toner 2 theory for flocking, because there is a sort of a mixture of flocking behavior and disorder. I mean, you have these vertical patterns. So you need to destabilize the flow at certain intermediate wave numbers. But you also need to inject energy uh, through activ activity terms. Uh, there are other assumptions in the model. I won't go too much into it. Uh, for instance, uh, that the velocity is perfectly aligned with the local polar uh, direction. So you do not solve two equations. You just assume that you're moving in the direction where you're pointing which may not be a very good approximation, but it seems to work. So there are some experiments, uh, as I showed you earlier. And if you do a simulation of these equations, then uh, this is the vorticity field. So the red and the blue are oppositely signed vortices, and they are moving around. And I mean, if you sort of blur your eyes, they sort of look similar, uh, these two flows. And of course, there have been a lot of studies with this model, and it's, uh, it's quite capable of reproducing these uh, experimentally observed flows. Uh, and what's also interesting is that Although the model originally came from phenomenology, people have also derived the same thing uh, by coarse-graining microswimmer models. So it seems that there is some robustness in this uh, theory. So for the purpose of my talk, we've, we don't change all these parameters. There are quite a few. We map them onto this original experiments, but we do vary activity because you want to see what kind of flow states are accessible in this system. Uh, because of the sign of alpha, Negative alpha means injection of energy. So that's something you should keep in mind. More negative your alpha, the more energy you're injecting. Uh, and, and from left to right, you see that's a frictional system, so mostly disordered. Here you see some uh, active organization. Here you really see large scale organization also kicking in. And this, the, these kind of states really look like turbulence. So now I've used the word turbulence a few times. So we really need to uh, sort of define what we mean by turbulence because we all, of course, have encountered turbulence in many, uh, many settings, but they are typically at large scales. So you have, for instance, formation of thunderclouds, uh, crashing waves. Uh, if you were attentive during the coffee break, you might have observed something like this uh, over there. This one's very interesting because you have mixing of plankton uh, in Earth's oceans, and this is a storm on Jupiter. So you really see the land scales are very different, but the patterns are not. Uh, this is a Schlieren image of uh, blowing out a candle, so you see 
very vigorous convection there. And there was a very interesting uh, gallery of fluid motion poster, which shows that probably the uh, sort of a primordial sculpture of the Sphinx was sculpted by turbulence or airflow over, over this large body of clay, which was later sculpted into uh, what we know as the Sphinx today. So there's really a lot of similarities between these images and movies. But the question comes down to what can we really define and quantify? Uh, because if we want to call something turbulence, just a visual similarity is not enough. We really need uh, some quantitative measures. So again, just for this talk, I'll only focus on four aspects of turbulence. And that's what we'll probe in active turbulence. There can be more. So turbulence really depends on who you ask, uh, what turbulence is. Uh, so for us, these four parameters were the most important. What are they? So the first one is universality. Um, so this is, uh, this is a snapshot from the Johns Hopkins turbulence database. And I'm showing you the kinetic energy field. Uh, you see all kinds of structures there. The key, key point here is that the distribution of energy over modes, so wave numbers and energy, they, they follow a, a universal distribution, uh, which goes as k minus 5 thirds. Of course, this only holds when, when you're far from the injection scales of energy and far from dissipation, because depending on how you inject energy, you can break the scale invariance. And of course, dissipation also breaks scale invariance in some way. But uh, in the intermediate range, you can have uh, a universal scaling. And you see all these experiments have, uh, they fall on top of each other uh, in this range. So universality is one very important aspect. The other is intermittency. So again, I'm showing you uh, turbulence data, uh, slightly higher Reynolds number. But now I'm showing you the dissipation field. And uh, you can note the patterns are very different in dissipation as compared to kinetic energy. So if you zoom into that segment, you see very intense and uh, condensed kind of structures, uh, whereas most of the field remains quiescent. So if you probe, uh, if, you, if, if you have a turbulent flow and you put a probe inside it and you measure quantities like gradients or vorticity or dissipation, you typically get a very flat signal most of the time. But you have these sudden bursts in the signal, which is what we call intermittency here. Uh, so, so bursts in signals, large deviations. And how do you quantify this? Well, you just see what the distribution looks like in a very simplistic sense. And uh, you get very non-Gaussian fat tails in these distributions. Uh, in fact, as you increase the Reynolds number, if you look at uh, some quantity, which is here, it's entropy, so it's a second order moment, but it, it really uh, has very, very wide tails compared to the mean. And intermittency has been a well, so main problem in turbulence theory because it, it, it leads to anomalous scaling of velocity moments. Uh, it breaks scale invariance, and most importantly, it makes closures very difficult. So if you're trying to model turbulence, if things were Gaussian, you could come up with simpler theories. But intermittency really makes uh, these kind of theories challenging. Therefore, also in engineering applications, it's very hard to model turbulence uh, in all its aspects. You can typically model one part of turbulent flows. Um, the third aspect, which we look at, is chaos. Now, this one is very interesting as well. Uh, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with the notion of chaos. So uh, you've also probably seen the butterfly, the Lorenz uh, attractor. So th this is a nice movie which shows you the view of a particle traveling in the attractor. So what do you see when you're moving around? Now, if, if the system is chaotic and if you had a neighbor who's traveling with you, then you know you diverge exponentially. And that's a sign of chaos. You can measure how quickly you diverge. That gives you the rate of chaos uh, in a simple manner. And it's important to note that not all chaotic flows are turbulent. So you can have laminar flows as well, or all kinds of flows that are, uh, that are, cha sorry, that are chaotic. Uh, but turbulence is definitely very, very chaotic. Uh, in fact, if you measure the Lyapunov exponent in turbulence, like you would for a Lorenz model, that can simply increase with the Reynolds number, and it does not saturate. And uh, something that you probably experience from your own life about chaos in turbulence is you cannot predict the weather beyond seven days. Uh, that's really just a consequence of how, what's the Lyapunov exponent of the largest scales. And this is a fundamental limit you cannot cross. So it does not matter how powerful, powerful your computers will be, even 10 years from now or 20. This is a limit which, uh, which you cannot break. So we want to consider chaos. And a related concept, of course, is diffusion. This is also very important. Because typically how you model turbulent flows in uh, most engineering applications is you say, well, I do not care about all the details of these eddies and uh, velocity fields. I only care that they, they add an extra diffusivity. So you can put an enhanced diffusivity, and for many applications, it works. Uh, if you look at tracer trajectory, so here on top, you have a chaotic flow. Uh, and you see the energy spectrum is not completely formed. Uh, 
uh, if, if you make the flow more vigorous, you see a scaling emerges here, and your tracers, they, they really go crazy over there. And if you look at the mean square displacements of these tracers, it, they simply follow this diffusive scaling at long times. Uh, what's interesting is that if you increase the intensity of turbulence, so here you have u square, you could make a different measure. This d increases uh, here linearly. Uh, what's very important is that you can only change d by changing the intensity of turbulence. You do not have a power to change uh, the exponent of t. So you cannot make it go as t to the power 1.5, for instance. It will always go as d times t. But d is something you can change. So these are the four aspects we want to consider. There are some very important differences to keep in mind between inertial and active turbulence. Uh, the key things being that you inject energy at the large scales for inertial turbulence. For active turbulence, it's always at the small scales. Uh, there is a forward cascade of energy in inertial turbulence. And by cascade, we really mean there's a separation between injection and dissipation. So there's a whole range of intermediate scales that only transfer energy around. They do not change it in any way. Uh, this does not happen in active turbulence because these are typically low Reynolds number, highly viscous systems, so all scales dissipate here. Uh, but you do have an inverse flux of energy because you clearly have a larger scale organization coming from the uh, energy injection of individual particles. So there's definitely a flux involved here. So with these uh, sort of disclaimers in mind, we want to ask uh, what is the picture of active turbulence with regards to universality, intermittency, chaos, and diffusion. Now, of course, people have asked these questions before. Uh, so what they found was active turbulence is non-universal. So if you look at the scaling of the energy spectrum, yeah. Go to the previous slide. Yeah, so first difference that you're saying that energy injection should be at small scale for the active case. So why should it be like, can't it be at large scale? Well, I mean, you're right. I mean, of course, uh, how we inject energy is just alpha multiplied with u. Uh, so at least in the model, you're absolutely right, because um, whatever the spectrum of u, you're multiplying that with some constant, right? So if you have a large scale, well, large scale which is organized, that will also inject energy. But uh, in, in your physical system, it's really coming from the injection at small scales. So here you have a range of flows where most of them you still inject energy at relatively smaller scales. But there are certain states where you might also be injecting. Uh, at last case. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the question. Right, so what people found was that uh, the scaling of the energy spectrum is non-universal. So up to leading order, you have this k raised to power delta, and this delta is a function of activity. Uh, the other thing what they showed was that, well, if you look at velocity differences or gradients, then they remain uh, nicely Gaussian, so it's a very quiescent, tame kind of a flow. Uh, so this is, so we wanted to revisit these, uh, these questions. So uh, here, I think this will also answer some of your questions. So what you see here is the energy spectrum for different levels of activity. So that arrow again is showing you in, well, in alpha, the increasing level of activity. So this alpha minus one, which is fairly mild level of active turbulence, you have one vortex scale, right? I mean, more or less, this is the length scale of the problem. So your energy spectrum, it peaks there and then it falls off. Uh, once you start changing alpha, this uh, slope becomes shallower and shallower. And at some point, very interestingly, it even flips sine which shows that now there's a large scale organization. So the one on the right, uh, there all the scales are energized, even the larger scales. And that picture sort of shows you that there is some saturation in the spectral scaling. So it does not change further uh, beyond this point. So you can extract the scaling exponent. So if you just fit power laws to, uh, well, the low wave number part of the spectra, uh, you'll get the pointer stops working. Anyway. So then you get uh, basically, um, yeah. So there's a regime which is non-universal and then uh, th that's what was known earlier. But beyond a certain alpha, there seems to be uh, universal scaling. And this was quite interesting because there, is a, there seems to be a critical value of alpha beyond which there's almost a phase transition uh, to this, this sort of, a, well, phase transition to this kind of, a, uh, this kind of scaling. Now, Uh, that's a good question. So it's also the other parameters. So here it's not the system because it's the size of the system, but if you change the other diffusion terms, for instance, or the damping terms, that will change alpha C. So that's why I don't want to put a number to alpha C because it's more about the fact that it's there. 
will see a drop over to small scale reducer. Uh, where, where, sorry? Yeah. This first drop. Yes. So you're saying move to the left side? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so if you, of course, if you make the system much bigger, then there'll again be a dip in your, uh, in the spectra. So there is a limit to the largest organization which is there in some sense. That's the peak which you're seeing in the beginning. Now if I, let's say, make the system four times larger, which would be expensive, but you could do it, then again it would indeed come down. But so we... That's not the transition you're That's not the transition you're referring to. We are referring to the trans, uh, fact that there is this slope here, I mean, in these range of uh, wave numbers which, which changes. So of course, if you go to very, very large systems, you'll again see this kind of a behavior. So this really is, we are not able to resolve that. Uh, then you'd see what you saw for the turbulence case, right? I mean, you, the, the, in the beginning, it's flat, and then you have scaling. So we expect we'd get that also. So uh, I have a question, sir. Yes. Maybe I have missed you. What the aspect ratio of these particles? They're not sphere, right? No. No. So the aspect ratio typically is around 4 or 5. I, there, there's a plot where, which will show aspect ratio. We do not have aspect ratio, right? Because we've coarse-grained the system. So we are solving continuum equations. So you coarse grain over a bunch of bacteria, and you say, okay, locally they have a certain velocity where they are moving. So we, we lose that kind of information in a model. And no like bacteria-bacteria interaction and all, only because of velocity field they are aligning? Um, yeah, uh, sorry, could you phrase it differently? So uh, earlier you showed a simulation, right, in that those particles were aligning, like oh, right. they were right. exhibiting some coordinated moment, right? So here you have to understand that, okay, so I understand your question. It, the motivation for the model is those things. But of course, when you solve it in the continuum sense, you have the toner two terms, which are the flocking equivalent for uh, the Wicksec model. So there are the polar ordering terms from there. So that's how they align. Uh, and then there are length scales set by the uh, swift Honberg terms, which are higher order uh, Laplacians. So they set some length scale as well. So it comes from that, but in a continuum sense. So I just want to know uh, how the Reynolds number is being calculated because for a very small scale, uh, it's quite low. So we are not calculating it, uh, but people have done that because if you, if you see the equation, there are some additional terms. So it's a little difficult to describe the viscosity exactly here. Uh, but if you form an effective viscosity, your Reynolds number, if you follow that definition, which uh, Rahul Pandit's group, they've done it in uh, ISC. So there your uh, Reynolds number would change by a factor of 1,000 from top to bottom. So in that sense, it might even be inertial there in some sense. Yeah, so what I wanted to mention was that, well, I won't show the details, but if you also go to the equation for the energy spectrum, the details are here in this paper. Uh, you can also show actually that uh, the leading order term, it loses its alpha dependence beyond a critical activity. And if you make a measurement of the energy flux and uh, some details like that, you can also recover a delta minus 3 half uh, scaling uh, from, from the equation. Where is it? Uh, that's the scaling of the energy flux. So if your flux goes as k raised to power zeta, that zeta shows up here. Is that independent of alpha? Yes. Because the flux becomes independent of alpha itself. So then zeta doesn't change with alpha. We don't predict, we cannot predict zeta. You have to make a measurement of something. So there's this triangle of sadness, if you want, which is about uh, you have the energy scaling, you have, the, uh, you have a time scale and a flux. You have to measure at least one of them to get any of these numbers. So for instance, in inertial turbulence, you assume the flux to be flat. So you know it's k to the power zero, so you make that assumption, and then you get minus five thirds and so on. So uh, zeta is positive uh, when you measure it. No, no, oh, sorry, that's delta, right? I mean. Zeta when one is delta. No. Uh, oh, one second. No, zeta minus one with the E naught. So you need to also resolve the E naught. Oh, okay. Then you get it. Yeah, yeah. Right. And is this minus three halves interesting? I mean, it turns out that if uh, people have also looked at inertial, uh, well, turbulence and active pneumatics, and they get an exponent very close to minus three halves. Uh, epithelial turbulence, also MSD turbulence, wave turbulence, and as we show in bacterial turbulence, at least in the model, uh, so it could be that there is some larger universality between these kind of flows as well, uh, because they do arrive at a similar exponent, but uh, we do not know uh, much more about that. All right, so the other thing is uh, transition to intermittency. So as I mentioned, intermittency we'll only consider to be deviation from Gaussianity, 
So here I'm just showing you the vorticity above different levels of the RMS. So of course, if you have a Gaussian signal, you do not expect uh, things beyond five to six times the RMS to be frequent. So the plot becomes black, but I mean, at uh, well, highly active turbulence, you see these streaks of uh, vorticity that are moving around. And uh, you can quantify that by looking more accurately at the velocity difference. And that's important because the delta u parallel, I mean, that has this r built into it. So you can probe different length scales. So you can look at differences across different lengths. And if they are also non-Gaussian, then you have a whole range of scales uh, that are intermittent. And there is a deviation from Gaussianity, which you see here. But uh, you can also see it as a transition if you want. So you just fix the value of r, and you vary your activity. And then again, you see there is some critical activity beyond which uh, you have a deviation from Gaussianity if you look at the kurtosis of these distributions. So this is the fourth moment. And uh, for Gaussian distributions, you, you see three, which is above certain activity. But after that, it picks up. So there is also this emergence of uh, intermittency uh, in the system. This is the one about cell aspect ratio. So there has been uh, one work some time ago which showed uh, these non-Gaussian distributions, but for velocity and vorticity. So not for velocity differences, but still for related quantities. So it could be that those are the first signs of intermittency in experiments, which uh, remains to be probed. And you really see that it changes with the cell aspect ratio. So the aspect ratio is a very important parameter for determining what kind of flow you are getting in the swarming state of bacteria. Right. So the next one was chaos. Uh, so how do we measure chaos? Um, so if you work with the Lorentz model, what you typically do is you solve uh, these uh, equations for a certain initial condition. You perturb that initial condition. And then you measure how the difference between the two simulations grows. Uh, if it grows exponentially for a certain while, that's a chaotic system. So you play exactly the same game here, where you let your simulations evolve onto a statistical steady state. Then you make a copy of the simulation. So these are called twin simulations. And you perturb the twin. Uh, you can perturb it spectrally. You can perturb it locally in space, as I've done here, just to show you how this small spot will grow uh, over time. And uh, then you just measure the difference between the two simulations. So this is showing you delta omega now. So you see, initially, the difference is simply the spot which I've put in. Uh, so this is really the butterfly effect, uh, if you want. So you see that a small perturbation is just growing to the size of the complete system until it dominates. And uh, you can track this sort of a quantity in time. And then you can ask how, how quickly perturbations are growing as a function of your activity. Uh, if you take uh, this kind of a norm of your, uh, let's say, difference velocity or difference vorticity, you can get what's called the t correlator, which is simply a space averaged uh, delta u squared here, uh, well, kinetic energy equivalent. And you see it, very, it has a very clean exponential growth for a certain while, and then it saturates. Uh, and you can do this for different levels of activity. Now you can fit exponentials to the first half of these curves, and you can extract the Lyapunov exponent, uh, which is simply just uh, phi going as exponential lambda t. And what you see is uh, what you see is that this lambda also saturates. Uh, now this was also this was quite interesting because, as I mentioned in inertial turbulence, this lambda can keep growing with the Reynolds number, but here it doesn't do that uh, because it seems like there is a limit to the largest scales that are possible in the system uh, because of how well uh, the dynamics is, which does not allow for any further larger scales uh, to develop. So it's, it really is a finite scale separation effect, uh, is what we think uh, is happening here, uh, that your lambda saturates. That said, I mean, you still have the maximally chaotic state at high activity. So you do have the most amount of chaos. It's just that it does not increase any further. Uh, you can, you can look at some interesting details, like the growth of the spectrum of this difference now. So you see how small perturbations are growing spectrally. And uh, this reveals something very nice. So the panel in the middle shows you the perturbation, which is the straight line in the beginning. And then it immediately forms this kind of a shape, which keeps growing until saturation. And that's really because there's only one length scale in the system. Uh, so you have essentially a one Lyapunov exponent, and uh, this grows until uh, you saturate. But what happens in the large uh, activity case is uh, something interesting. The small scales, which are the high wave numbers, they saturate first. And then slightly larger and slightly larger scales, they successively saturate. So if you look at the smallest wave numbers, the points uh, at the left, then they're probably not even saturated. And in fact, uh, this becomes clear if you look at the decorrelator, the orange one, there's still a slight slope. It has not flattened out completely. Uh, 
uh, it will flatten out after much longer times. And this is exactly the, I mean, reminiscent of the seven days of predictability, which you have from the climate, which is also known as, for instance, the permanence of large eddies and so on, that these large structures are fairly robust. Uh, and this really reflects that there is a large scale organization in the flow. You have a whole spectrum of Lyapunov exponents uh, in the problem now. All right. So this is so far in the Eulerian picture, right? Everything we did was with fields. We looked at spectra, we looked at intermittency, we looked at chaos. So the question is what happens in the Lagrangian framework? That's where we uh, encounter diffusion. So here again, people had studied this problem before. Uh, so in interestingly, uh, everybody who's looked at the diffusion in this model have been at ICTS at some point. <laughs> Uh, uh, now, what they found in the simulations was you get this ballistic to diffusive transition, classical diffusion. Uh, whereas, if you look at experiments, uh, this was a very interesting paper uh, by Galerial, uh, where they showed that um, in the swarming state, uh, the bacteria can actually perform uh, anomalous diffusion. And you get this uh, fairly high exponent 1.6, and uh, they characterize these trajectories as Levy box and so on. And we wondered why has this not been seen in the simulations. So we wanted to probe uh, the Lagrangian picture in a similar manner. And I want to start by showing you this, uh, this movie about the diffusion of a puff of tracers in, uh, in well, mild and uh, highly active turbulence. And the colors are simply to represent mixing. So you see where each particle ends up uh, in time. On the left, you, you really see all the vortices are being picked up. And this is really a, uh, mostly a chaotic phenomena. But on the right, there are more interesting things. There's multi-scale features, there are vortices. But interestingly, you have very nice material segments that persist in time. So they, they retain their shape and they move ahead. And then they suddenly twist and they break. So there clearly is a difference between the movie on the left and the right in the dynamics of these tracers. By the way, these are just tracer particles. So they, they don't have any inertia of their own. They simply follow the flow. Um, and there is a clear change in, uh, in the, way they, the way they move. So what's happening uh, in mean square displacements? So at mild activity, you clearly have the ballistic to diffusive transition. And your tracer trajectories look, uh, have that kind of a diffusive uh, feature. Now, the possibilities for your mean square displacement are as follows. I mean, typically, you'll always have ballistic diffusion uh, at short time, well, ballistic motion, and diffusion at long time. So goes as t. Uh, this is the first possibility. Uh, what you might have is this, that at intermediate times, you have a regime of anomalous diffusion. Uh, so it's not, it should not be a crossover or so, it really has to be a robust uh, thing. That's why it's often difficult to get, get this cleanly in experiments and also in simulations. Um, but if you push the system a little bit, system sizes typically, because you need to have long persistent trajectories, uh, then what you can find is that there's a very robust regime of super diffusion which comes out at high levels of activity. So there really is a transition from ballistic to diffusive to ballistic to anomalous. So, and, yeah. Uh, why it's changing from super to like normal diffusion? Because say that again. So in start initially it was exhibiting super diffusion, right? In the beginning it's always ballistic. That's because so, you have a velocity and you evolve with that until the velocity decorrelates in time, and then you only have diffusive motion. So we can't get uh, super diffusive like for all the time scale. You cannot get it if the flow is chaotic. I mean, if you simply have an advection in one direction you're always ballistic because you're simply evolving with a velocity. So this is just, I mean, uh, u times t squared. Uh, well, my question is because in, when it's a chaotic, we say it's not periodic, right? Sure. So that's why I thought it, will, it should always uh, show super diffusion. No, so in, you'll always have ballistic in the beginning. You can or not have super diffusion or sub diffusion. Uh, it really depends. Um, but ballistic is just the fact that's okay. If you are a particle, the first thing you observe is thermal noise. So if you're making experiments, you'll first go as diffusive. Then you see the local velocity scale. Then you go as ballistic. And then depending on the organization of the flow, you can go as diffusive, super diffusive, a whole range of things. So what you see here is super diffusion. Yeah. Right. So you get this uh, super diffusion here. So. That does not tell you anything about the nature of trajectories, what's happening to individual trajectories. So let's look at that closely. So you have, well, the diffusive ones, they're simply twisting and turning because they hit a lot of vortices. But the anomalous ones also notice that the length scales are very different. That's 0.5 there, and this is 10 in whatever units, but it's really 20 times larger. Uh, you have these large persistent segments 
in the trajectory. And what you want to measure is the waiting times between turns. So the color here is done in the following way. You first find uh, the turning angle at each point in your trajectory. You pick some threshold and you say, okay, if my trajectory turns larger than that, I call it a turning point. And then between successive points, you can uh, have waiting time distributions and you can have step size distributions. And it really depends on what this distribution is, which will determine the nature of diffusion in your problem. So what we find is you get a power law distribution for waiting times for a few values of this threshold because the threshold is arbitrary. Uh, and then you get an exponent which is around minus eight thirds within a numerical error. Now, you can also write the exponent out slightly differently as tau to the gamma, uh, to the minus gamma minus one, and then you get this gamma is equal to five thirds. Why that is important is because uh, that five thirds together with the four thirds that you get from MSDs, that uh, they satisfy a criteria for levy box from levy box theory. So you can say for sure that, okay, these trajectories are doing, I mean, the particles are performing levy box, that's why they are anomalous. And it's, it's very nice to find this sort of a thing, I think, because there's a lot of debate about what is the use of levy box, because that again happens across nature. So you have large scale organisms that perform these kind of motions, small scale organisms as well. So there are sort of hypotheses that it increases encounter rates between uh, entities. It helps evasion. Uh, it also helps in foraging. So it's nice that with this model, you can also capture these kind of effects uh, in the Lagrangian framework. So what was also nice was uh, just uh, about two and a half weeks ago, there was a paper on archive. So this is a group from IIT Kanpur where they performed experiments on E. coli and they found exactly the same uh, in fact, the exponents as well as the model predicts. So they find anomalous diffusion with four thirds and waiting time distributions. So this was quite quite nice to see. So what is the times, which gives you three by two? Right. We do not understand that yet. I think. Yeah, yeah. But it would be nice to know how it's done in the glassy system. So if if something could be checked here. Yeah. Yeah. So this I'll just flash for uh, uh, some of you who are interested. Maybe is. If you also look at first passage problems, so how, how quickly, well, if you define a certain radius uh, within which your particles have to travel, also called the survival time, uh, you get also anomalous scaling for the high activity case for intermediate radii, because there seems to be that your trajectories are of two kinds. They are sort of diffusive or they are persistent. And depending on the length scales that you probe, it's either the persistent ones which will dominate or the diffusive ones. So that's what I want to get to with the uh, first passage. Uh, because that leads us to a very interesting uh, aspect of active flows, which is not there at all in inertial turbulence. And that comes, in fact, from glassy systems. So let's look at first what persistent and diffusive trajectories look like. So I simply define a distance for each trajectory to travel. And then I ask, how long does the trajectory take to reach there? How long does a particle take to reach there? And then you can sort your particles in time. Uh, and then you can pick the fastest and the slowest particles. So on the left, you have the fastest and the slowest. I've, of course, artificially put them in a common center. They, they start all over uh, somewhere in the flow. And the color just tells you where they are hitting this target circle. Uh, the color is very useful here because it shows something interesting. And I mean, you would also see it in black and white. But uh, there's interesting bundling happening between some trajectories. So they seem to have a similar Lagrangian history. Because you can imagine having two trajectories look the same is not very possible in a highly chaotic turbulent flow because it really depends on the entire Lagrangian history uh, where you've been. And this is something uh, which is interesting. The slowest ones, of course, they sample all of space. They take forever to reach uh, this circle. So there seems to be uh, persistence, uh, and there seems to be a change in the nature of the flow beyond a certain activity. So are these two things linked? So uh, let's look again at the flow fields. So if you look at the middle panel, what you'll notice is, and there's a small segment we've zoomed into, uh, what it shows you are these small vortices, which are the spots. And if you look at streamlines of the velocity, then the streamlines just go around uh, the spots. But there are these streak-like patterns that also emerge. And if you look at streamlines there, they seem to be persistent. Uh, so we thought, okay, this might not always be the case. So we tried to push the system further. And here's a case of, let's just call it an extreme case of active turbulence where you have very clearly defined streaks. And there again, you see the same thing that the streaks, near the streaks, you always have this kind of persistent behavior. So this is a very clear first sign that the Eulerian and Lagrangian pictures are linked, but you can do better. 
uh, you could initialize your tracers in the spots or the streets. So if I put a bunch of tracers in the street regions, you see that they evolve in a very persistent ballistic manner. But if you start in these spotted regions, they hit so many vortices that they become highly chaotic, and this is really diffusive. So if you calculate mean square displacements, as you asked, you'd get t square in top, and here you'll get t. But of course, each tracer samples all regions in some sense, so you get something in between. And if you look at the origins of the fastest tracers which I showed you, you see they are sort of nicely, these, the, that's the orange triangles, they are nicely bundled in these uh, kind of regions. And this should really uh, make you suspicious and ask, is there a dynamical heterogeneity uh, in the problem? Are there some regions that make you move faster than others? Uh, and this, as I mentioned, does not happen uh, in inertial turbulence for tracers. Uh, so, for that, what you need to do is one last bit, which is to define the streaks in some manner. Now, it really doesn't matter how you do that, as long as it robustly picks the streak regions out. Uh, we, thought, we found that if you put a threshold on the vorticity and something called the Okubo Weiss parameter, again, the details are not so important, you can get a mask of this kind. And if I put a mask on the flow, I have mostly the streak regions with some amount of robustness. And this is very useful because now I have a point-wise criteria telling me whether I'm inside or outside a streak region, right? So I can go back to my trajectories, I can look at their entire Lagrangian history, and I can segment them in inside and outside of streak regions, and that will give you, again, uh, a bunch of residence times and a bunch of displacements, depending on where you are in the flow. And this is very important because, as I mentioned, this is a very dynam dynamic uh, kind of a system. So one trajectory will always sample all kinds of regions. So you really need these kind of uh, sort of structure reduction, if you want, to, to find out where you are in the flow. And if you look at how far you travel, which is this phi, and how long you stay in a region, uh, the picture is clear. I mean, when you're outside, you spend a lot more time, because that's most of the flow. But where you are, when you're in the streak regions, your distribution is highly skewed towards higher values of phi. And that really shows that you're much more likely to travel further when, uh, when you are in these regions. So, that brings me to the end. So I hope I've shown you that, I mean, active turbulence, it can, of course, be non-universal. Uh, non uh, it can be Gaussian uh, and diffusive at mild activity. But there clearly is something like a transition to states that are universal, intermittent, maximally chaotic, with sort of multi-scale dynamics in the same way as inertial turbulence. And very interestingly, these uh, Lagrangian anomalies, which do not exist in uh, inertial turbulence problems, and this is what I mean when I say that living turbulence is a matter of states. So I will end here. I do want to mention that it was a real pleasure to work on this with Rahul, uh, Martin, and Samriddhi here over the last three years. Uh, here's my contact as well and some references. Uh, and I thank you for your attention. Now, time for questions. So, uh, I have a question. So, you just showed us some data on dynamical heterogeneity. Um, so, have you tried changing the activity to see if they, the, you know, the cluster sizes change? change yes. or? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, we have, uh, so you can look at this figure. This should show you. So, the, uh, so let's say if you look at the fastest trajectories right. in highly active turbulence, you get these cluster regions. Okay. If you look at the mild cases, they are randomly distributed. So there is no clustering in that case. Oh, okay. So that thing really emerges after some, some activity. Is that same as the alpha C that you had? Yes, I would, I would say so. Okay. Yeah. Because the anomalous diffusion is also coming after that alpha C. So I didn't, we didn't check this exact thing with alpha C. But uh, since anomalous diffusion is coming up there, I, I would say this will also. Okay, so you're saying that this is something like a glossy state here? Then, in which case, as you increase the activity, you know, the dynamical heterogeneity, is, the system can actually melt. Do you see yes. that? Um, in some sense, yes. Uh, I'm not an expert on that, although people have also studied melting of vortex crystals and uh, glassy states in this model, but they didn't look at dynamical heterogeneity. So there you could also have, I think, melting states where this is happening. So, um, I just have a doubt, like, in the turbulence, you have um, uh, non-Gaussian tails, right? You have, so, uh, is that any, is that, is that have any correlation with 
the tracer tracers being having a diffuse motion oh, that's a good point actually i mean people have looked at okay so the non gaussian tails you have to be careful are extreme events so they are very rare so there'll be very few points in the flow where you have very large deviations if you look at uh, tracers or particles conditioned in these regions uh, i mean not tracers so much but if you have inertial particles then uh, they can have slingshot effects and so on and people have looked at that uh, and then you can get persistence but typically in the flow you would not get that because their contribution is very little to the overall diffusion of the tracers and i don't even know if tracers would have that in in the extreme uh, extreme events here you are, you are finding for active turbulence uh, you are finding a diffusive a super diffusive yes. so uh, but the uh, so in the last slide i saw you mentioned a gaussian uh, nature as well okay is there somewhere but yeah yeah i mean the last conclusion slide i have seen this one yeah the non universal gaussian yes so i just want to know the correlation here as well like here actually it is super diffusive right the diffusion it's super diffusive in the second version huh? i mean it's super diffusive after the transition mm -hmm. these states it's not super diffusive in the in the case where it's only so in the long time it is super diffusive right in the long time limit not in time it's not about time it's about the level of activity so the point is um okay so the point here is that the nature of the flow is changing in the second case so you should not think i would say about whether the intermittent events are doing it because they are also very few in the flow uh, and in fact if you look at these streak regions which i told you which are aiding in this persistent motion they are not the intermittent events and i'll show you how uh, so if you look at this figure over here then uh, the streak regions well so the, sorry there's no color bar but they are typically milder than the spot regions so most of the intermittent structures i would say are around those spots whereas the streaks are still mild so the uh, so this persistent motion and diffusion is actually coming from the milder part of the flow okay thank you um so you said there's um the lianopov exponent uh, saturation you said that it could be a finite size effect Right. can you elaborate on that finite uh, yeah maybe that was a sad choice of words it should be a, f a finite range of scales i meant okay. so there you, we are not able to add more and more scales to the problem as you can do in inertial turbulence right because you can make the larger scales even larger or you can reduce your viscosity and then you have finer scales so the range of scales can be increased in an arbitrary manner and that's why lyapunov can keep increasing here there's an inverse organization which we don't have so much control over and that's that's what i meant by the finance yeah. point was going back to the experiments the bacterial experiments yeah. um like this is just like a future thing do you plan to look for these streak things there as well and how do you would you have a same control of activity parameter in that Uh, in the experiments if right. you plan to link them so uh, so uh, the f to answer the first one the paper which i showed you which showed similar exponents they also mentioned this that they have certain regions like this in the flow but they do not uh, analyze them too much but it seems like there there is so when they look at streamlines you get these sort of uh, uh, well <laughs> persistent streamlines in these kind of regions so there might be some in experiments but we cannot vary the activity as much so you're right in in fact you can typically only reduce the activity it's very hard to increase it too much okay. but you could also go to a different strain of bacteria which is just more motile okay. there's always a lookout for those and if they have a collective state then you could study uh, probably these kind of things thank you kabir do do you see something at large alpha for example you had a decaying lyapunov exponent does it ever reach zero as you increase alpha oh uh, yeah. i see what you mean well, zero i'm not sure it does decrease quite a bit i mean because what happens is it saturate at some value of alpha i don't know if it uh, i mean if it saturates it go to i would guess saturated zero but if you look at the let's say it's very hard to see that movie because it's hardly moves but this one so if you look at the first one uh, it seems mostly sort of jammed in some sense so what also typically happens i guess is 
uh, I mean, this will freeze even more and more. So that's why the Lyapunov is going down. Maybe, so if it reaches a completely jam state, then you'll have zero Lyapunov exponent. Yes, another transition. <laughs> alpha? There could be, I don't know. I have I've, I've not tested that. But that's, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Maybe we'll go, go with him first, eh? and then. Tell you talked about. So you you spoke about this intermediate value of injection energy, uh, and and you get uh, minus five third exponent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering, uh, like, what? Oh, you mean for inertial turbulence, or? Yes. 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 Okay. Yeah. So I was wondering what will happen uh, if if your injection energy is smaller than the intermediate value and larger than the intermediate value. Right. So there is a. Uh, okay. Let me see where that figure is. So this one maybe. Right. So you see, if you start, so, okay. So the large scale is determined by the problem or the physical system. So if you're doing convection in this room, the large scale is set by the typical dimension of the room. The small scale here would be set by the viscosity. Uh, so if you start forcing more and more towards the viscous limit, then at some point you won't have turbulence, right? Because you are going to a low Reynolds number flow. So it really, Reynolds, I mean, length by viscosity times velocity. So if you're really going to the smaller and smaller lengths, then you won't have this kind of organization, you need the separation of scales uh, to have an intermediate range of scales. So, so why do you consider any non-Gaussian nature as intermittent? Uh, is it is it true all the case? No, no, no. So I, I, I mean, so intermittency has many meanings in turbulence. So this is one definition of intermittency is that, okay, you also have these white tails. Of course, the definitions are all linked. They are not completely orthogonal. Uh, but this is the first sign that you look for is fat tails in your signals. So any intermittent phenomena will have this thing, uh, but not the other properties that come with intermittency problem. Yeah. So in the evaluation of Lyapunov exponents, so you are basically uh, tracking a tracer trajectory and see a neighboring trajectory, how it diverges, is it? Uh, so you uh, no. So how we are doing it here is this is Eulerian chaos. So we take the entire field and we see how the whole field diverges from its neighbor. So you make a neighboring field, right? That's the twin simulation. So both of them have similar. It's exactly the same game, except you do this uh, in an Eulerian sense. So you allow both the simulations to evolve, and you subtract the fields, and you see how they are diverging. So it's exactly the same thing, but not with particles. It's a, it's a kind of average Lyapunov exponent for the entire initial conditions on the space. Yes, but it does not depend on initial conditions. Uh, but I suppose if you start from different, in a Lagrangian sense, yeah. it will depend. But now you are taking in a whole average sense, exactly. you get a single number. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, in the case of the alpha being a large number, yeah, you show there's a, uh, like the motion is very restricted. Yes. But yes. Um, so if I think in terms of a Lagrangian sense, th there are small scales of vertical motions happening. And um, I mean, I have encountered a system where such a, it's like so organized, but still it can give a positive Lyapunov exponent. Yes. So, so that's why I said that uh, all, what did I say? <laughs> that uh, not all chaos is turbulence, right? That's exactly the point, that you can have a chaotic flow then, but that won't be turbulent. Okay. So that's why I put, and you're right, I mean, and if you look at tracers there, you might even get subdiffusion because you have trappings. So typically when you have a trapping kind of a system of any kind, you get something uh, where, where it's T less than one, in fact. So that could also be possible. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? If no, then let's thank uh, Siddhartha once again for the interesting talk. Um,